Early childhood is the developmental period from two to six years and is sometimes referred to as the preschool years. This is a period of the lifespan after infancy and before the child begins formal schooling. As in the previous period, a lot of changes occur. Early childhood is a period of rapid growth and change. In addition to the obvious physical signs of growth, children are also gaining a greater understanding of language, the world, themselves, and those around them. In this lecture, we will look at body changes, thinking during early childhood, language learning, and early childhood education. The rate of physical growth in early childhood is slower than what was found in infancy. Weight and height increases, and the relationship between these measurements changes. Average body mass index, BMI, is lower than at any other time of life. BMI is the ratio of weight to height. There is considerable difference in the body proportions of a child entering and exiting this stage. Children become slimmer as the lower body lengthens. The center of gravity moves from the uh, breastbone down to the belly button. Toddlers have large heads and stomachs and short arms and legs, but six-year-old children tend to have longer, leaner bodies as their torso lengthens. By the end of early childhood, the infant's protruding belly, round face, short limbs, and large head are distant memories. Appetite decreases between ages two and six because young children naturally grow more slowly than they did as infants. However, children in food insecure households are likely to overeat when they're not hungry. Broadly defined, food insecurity is the state of being without reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable, nutritious food. The important thing to note here is that it isn't always about the quantity of food. Uh, in many cases, it's a lack of access to fresh fruits and vegetables. While food security and hunger are related, they're not the same. Food insecurity is socioeconomic, while hunger is physiological. We could say that hunger is one potential consequence of food insecurity, but food insecurity does not always result in hunger. Food security is measured at the household level and hunger at the individual level. A family experiencing food insecurity may have some members that go hungry and others who do not. For example, parents uh, in food insecure families might have enough food to feed their children, but go without themselves. In low income family cultures, parents tend to guard against undernutrition and rely on fast foods. So their children are especially vulnerable to obesity. Many parents of overweight children believe their children are thinner than they actually are. Weight gain in early childhood is fluid and may be influenced by parental and childcare dietary choices for children. The slower growth rate translates into a smaller appetite for children in this period. This diminished appetite means these children are vulnerable to nutritional deficiencies. This is particularly true if those small appetites are satisfied with foods poor in nutrition. Children in the United States consume too many high fat, high sugar junk foods. And while the effects of such poor nutrition might not be immediately evident, the preference for eating such intensely sugary and fatty foods is being established and can interfere with nutrition for years to come. Oral health is important also. Teeth are influenced by diet and health. Tooth decay correlates with obesity and infected teeth may indicate or create health problems. About three to 8% of all young children have a food allergy, usually to a healthy common food. Cow's milk, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, soy, wheat, and shellfish are frequent culprits. Diagnostic standards and treatments may vary. Diagnosing food allergies is not easy. Identical symptoms may be caused by other disorders and pinpointing the offending food can be difficult. Your pediatrician may refer your child to an allergist who has several diagnostic options. An allergist might suggest an elimination diet, a procedure in which suspicious foods are removed from the diet for a period of time, and symptoms are closely monitored to see if they subside. Your doctor might also use skin and blood tests. He or she might prick the skin on your child's back or arm, and then introduce a liquid extract of the suspicious food 
tests to see if a response, swelling, and itchiness, for example, takes place. In terms of brain development, by age two, a child's brain weighs 75% of what it will in adulthood. The brain reaches 90% of adult weight by age six. Myelin development contributes to this increased weight. Myelin is a fatty coating on the axons that speeds signals between neurons. A gradual increase in myelination makes five-year-olds much quicker at thinking than three-year-olds who are quicker than toddlers. When babies are born, many of their nerves lack mature myelin sheaths. As a result, their movements are jerky, uncoordinated, and awkward. As myelin sheaths develop, movements become smoother, more purposeful, and more coordinated. From ages two to six, maturation of the prefrontal cortex has several notable benefits. Sleep becomes more regular. Emotions become more nuanced and responsive. Temper tantrums decrease or subside. Uncontrollable laughter and tears are less common. It is known that abnormalities of the prefrontal cortex are associated with many psychiatric disorders, such as attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, and autism. The corpus callosum is part of the brain that grows and myelinates rapidly during early childhood. It consists of a band of nerve fibers that connects the left and right sides of the brain and facilitates communication between the two brain hemispheres. Lateralization begins with genes and refers to the specialization in certain functions by each side of the brain, with one side dominant for each activity. Left-handedness has been shown in some newborns. It is discouraged and not accommodated in many cultures or contexts. It is advantageous in some professions. What makes someone right-handed versus left-handed? There are no clear answers, but there is growing evidence that left-hand dominant people tend to be more creative and divergent thinkers. Neuroscientists know that left-handed people tend to be more right-brained and use the right hemisphere of their cerebrum to a greater degree than righties. Left-handed people make up only 10% of the population and are underdogs in a world designed for right-handers. If you have a genetic disposition to be a lefty, Odds are that growing up in a right-handed world will make you more likely to think outside the box and become a leader. It's ironic that for centuries, teachers in schools would literally tie the left hand behind a student's back in an attempt to force pupils to be right-handed. Luckily, science is proving that allowing one's biological handedness to flourish leads to success. Five of our last seven American presidents have been left-handed. No young child is perfect at regulating attention because immaturity of the prefrontal cortex makes it impossible to moderate the limbic system. Impulsiveness and perseveration follow. Brain maturation and emotional regulation eventually allow most children to focus and switch as needed within their culture. Before such maturation, many young children jump from task to task. They cannot stay quiet. Other children engage in perseveration Perseveration is where some children persevere in or stick to one thought or action, unable to quit. The relationship between stress and brain activity depends on age and degree of stress. Developmentally appropriate stress aids cognition. Excessive stress hormone levels early in life may permanently damage brain pathways, especially in maltreated children. In early childhood, our brains are building wiring systems in response to our environments. A child who undergoes chronic intense stress can develop a low threshold to stress within the brain circuitry. Such a child may be nervous or hypervigilant. The neural circuits for dealing with stress are particularly malleable or plastic during the early childhood period. Early experiences shape how readily these circuits are activated and how well they can be contained and turned off. When children experience toxic stress, their cortisol levels remain elevated for prolonged periods of time. Both animal and human studies show that long-term elevations in cortisol levels can alter the function of a number of neural systems, suppress the immune response, and even change the architecture of regions in the brain that are essential for learning and memory. Early childhood is a time of learning to use thought to solve problems 
and learning to know and communicate about the world through the use of symbols, primarily language. In this next section, we'll take a look at how Piaget and Vygotsky uh, looked at uh, thinking during early childhood. Piaget said this was a period of pre-operational thought. Pre-operational means before logical operations. The child's verbal ability permits symbolic thinking and explains animism. Animism is the belief that inanimate objects, such as toys and teddy bears, have human feelings and intentions. Pre-operational thought is symbolic and magical, not logical and realistic. A major accomplishment of pre-operational intelligence is that it allows a child to think symbolically, including understanding that words can refer to things not seen, and that an item such as a flag can symbolize something else, in this case, a country. Piaget noted that children in this stage do not yet understand concrete logic, uh, cannot mentally manipulate information, and are unable to take the point of view of other people, which he termed egocentrism. Piaget believed that children are naturally curious. They constantly want to make sense of their experience and in the process construct theories which help them to understand the world. According to Piaget, children understand the world with schemes, psychological structures which organize experience. Schemes are mental categories of related events, objects, and knowledge. During infancy, most schemes are based on actions and infants group objects based on what actions they can perform on them. After infancy, schemes are based primarily on functional or relational concepts, not action. For example, preschoolers learn that forks, knives, and spoons form a functional category of things I use to eat. And they learn that dogs, cats, and goldfish form a conceptual category of pets. Certain obstacles to logic occur during early childhood. One is centration. It is characteristic of uh, pre-operational thought, whereby a young child focuses or centers on one idea, excluding all others. Piaget demonstrated centration in his experiments involving conservation. Another is uh, egocentrism. It's young children's tendency to uh, think about the world entirely from their own personal perspective. The Three Mountains problem demonstrates pre-operational egocentrism. Focus on appearance is characteristic of pre-operational thought, whereby a young child ignores all attributes that are not apparent. Uh, this is where uh, preschool children believe that an object's appearance tells what the object is really like. Uh, for instance, a three-year-old watches with fascination as an older brother or sister puts on a scary mask and then erupts in frightened tears. The scary mask is something that looks scary, but really isn't. There is confusion between appearance and reality. Here are a couple more obstacles to logic. Static reasoning is characteristic of pre-operational thought, whereby a young child thinks that nothing changes. Whatever is now has always been and always will be. When children believe the world is unchanging, for example, a boy may insist that the television uh, showing his favorite program is turned off when he goes to the bathroom, expecting the program to resume where it uh, left off and when he returns, having not missed anything. Another obstacle is irreversibility, characteristic of pre-operational thought, whereby a young child thinks that nothing can be undone. Uh, a thing cannot be restored to the way it was before a change occurred. For example, when a piece of lettuce is put on their burger, it is no longer just right and therefore never can be again. The concept of conservation is important during this period. It's the principle stating that the amount of a substance remains the same when its appearance changes. In the above picture, Sadie, age five, on the left carefully makes sure both glasses contain the same amount. Now on the right, when one glass of pink lemonade is poured into a wide jar, she triumphantly points to the tall glasses having more. Sadie is like all five-year-olds, seven-year-olds know better. This graphic reproduced from the text shows there are many manifestations of conservation. According to Piaget, until children grasp the concept of conservation, uh, he believed at about the age of six or seven, they cannot understand that the transformations shown here 
do not change the total amount of liquid, candy, and dough. There is a video in this module which demonstrates how children in this stage have difficulty with the conservation of volume and matter, as well as the centration and irreversibility obstacles to logic. A different perspective on thinking during early childhood was presented by Vygotsky, who emphasized social learning. Every aspect of children's cognitive development is embedded in the sociocultural context. Children learn from guided participation through mentors who present challenges, offer assistance without taking over, and add crucial information, which encourages uh, motivation. Most shirts for four-year-olds are wide-necked and without buttons, so preschoolers can put them on themselves. But the skill of buttoning is best learned from a mentor who knows how to increase motivation. The zone of proximal development is Vygotsky's term for the skills that a person can exercise only with assistance, not yet independently. The zone of proximal development is the difference between what children can do with assistance and what they can do alone. For example, a father and a four-year-old enjoy solving puzzles together. Although the child does most of the work, the father provides encouragement, sometimes finding a piece and uh, showing the child how to put the pieces together. When the four-year-old tries to put the puzzles together alone, he can rarely complete them. The zone is the area between the level of performance a child can achieve when working independently and a higher level of performance that is possible when working under the guidance of more skilled adults or peers. The idea of the zone follows from Vygotsky's basic premise. Cognition develops first in a social setting and only gradually comes under the child's independent control. Scaffolding aids in this shift. Scaffolding is a style in which teachers gauge the amount of assistance they offer uh, to match the, the learner's needs. Uh, the defining characteristic of scaffolding is giving help, but not more than is needed. Temporary help, in which an adult helps a child accomplish certain tasks. Uh, they may help guide their hands when mixing cake batter, or point to certain places on the page when reading a picture book to uh, help the child learn to read. Over-imitation is an interesting phenomenon. It's the tendency of children to copy an action that is not a relevant part of the behavior to be learned. And it's common among two to six year olds who will imitate adult actions that are irrelevant and inefficient. It's copying causally irrelevant actions in a goal-directed action sequence. For example, if you were trying to show a child how to open a box and you would wave a stick over the top three times or wiggle a useless lever that is not needed to open the box, the child will copy that behavior. Research has shown that mimicking occurs regardless of the child's cultural background. This is a universal human trait that may contribute to learning complex cultural norms. In other words, children are sensitive to learning social skills relevant to their particular culture and to fit into their social group. Researchers know that this is a uniquely human characteristic. Chimps would not imitate irrelevant actions and would use a more efficient strategy to open the box. Vygotsky saw language as a tool and considered language pivotal, especially through private speech, which involves internal dialogue when talking to self. Private speech was seen by Vygotsky as an intermediate step towards self-regulation of cognitive skills. At first, children's behavior is regulated by speech from other people. When youngsters first try to self-regulate, they instruct themselves by speaking out loud. As children gain skill, private speech becomes inner speech, or what we would refer to as thought. Social mediation advances and expands understanding. The social mediation function of speech occurs as mentors guide mentees in their zone of proximal development learning numbers, recalling memories, and following routines. Practical use of Vygotsky's theory concerns STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math education. Researchers found that when teaching STEM tasks in a social setting, children were more motivated. When children thought they were part of a group working on the task, they persisted longer at it. They were also more confident in their abilities and thought the STEM learning was more fun. 
Executive function develops during early childhood. It involves the cognitive ability to organize and prioritize the many thoughts that arise from the various parts of the brain. It is comprised of working memory, cognitive flexibility, and inhibitory control, and allows the person to anticipate, strategize, and plan behavior, and relates closely to emotional regulation throughout life. Vygotsky developed his theory on child development at the same time Piaget was developing his own theory. Like Piaget, Vygotsky believed that children develop through stages. Unlike Piaget, Vygotsky believed that learning and development were tied to social interactions and culture, whereas Piaget believed that children learn by doing. Uh, Vygotsky believed that they learn through being shown. Piaget highlighted the child's own curiosity and brain maturation in learning. Vygotsky stressed mentors, especially parents and teachers, in guiding children's learning. But both theories recognize that young children are prodigious learners who strive to understand their world. Children naturally attempt to explain everything they see and hear. They develop theories about intentions before they employ their impressive ability to imitate. Piaget said that uh, children, like scientists, formulate theories about how the world works. Children's theories are sometimes referred to as naive theories because, well, they're not like real scientific theories, which are created by researchers and evaluated by experiments. Theory of mind is a person's theory of what other people might be thinking. It's an emergent ability, slow to develop, but typically beginning in most children at about age four. Piaget developed the three mountain tasks to determine the level of egocentrism displayed by children. In this mountains game, you really get a sense that children aren't just little adults. They often see the world in surprising ways. Here, the adult and child sit at opposite sides of the table. They can see one side of the mountain scene in front of them. Once they've had a chance to look at the mountain, the adult asks the child to point to which of the four mountain scenes that the adult can see. This requires children to think about the mountain scene from another person's perspective. Often, younger children like five-year-old Brayden, they point to the mountain scene that corresponds with their own perspectives of the mountains and not the adults. However, a few years can make all the difference. Delaney, who is eight years old, can take someone else's perspective more easily. And instead of pointing to the scene from her own perspective, she points to the mountain scene that the adult can see. This game really shows how often children think about and see the world differently than adults. But this is a normal process where children develop what's called a theory of mind, or the ability to see something from someone else's perspective. Sometimes it seems like young children just don't care about other people's thoughts or feelings, but really it's a natural process of learning how to take another perspective and think about something in a very different way than they're used to. A child's ability to develop theories correlates with the maturity of the prefrontal cortex and with advances in executive processing. Executive functions lead to better understanding of false belief. The false belief task is used to demonstrate a fundamental shift in children's theory of mind, where children understand that behavior is based on a person's beliefs about events and situations, even when those beliefs are wrong. Children's understanding is revealed here. Now, Anne knows uh, the marble has been moved to the white box, but Sally believes it is still in the black box. Not until four years of age do most children correctly say that Sally will look for the marble in the black box, acting on her false belief. Four-year-olds understand that Sally's behavior is based on her belief, even though her belief is wrong. Language is pivotal to every kind of cognition in early childhood. It's a sensitive time. Brain maturation, myelination, scaffolding, and social interaction make early childhood ideal for learning language. Childhood is a sensitive period or best time to master vocabulary, grammar, and pronunciation. A vocabulary explosion occurs during this period. The average child knows about 500 words at age two and more than 10,000 at age six. Verbs, adjectives, adverbs, conjunctions, and many nouns are mastered. Fast mapping refers to the speedy and sometimes imprecise way in which children learn new words by tentatively uh, placing them in mental categories according to their perceived meaning. 
Fast mapping refers to a child's connections between words and reference that are made so quickly that he or she cannot consider all possible meanings of the word. Picture books offer opportunities to advance vocabulary through scaffolding and fast mapping. The growth of vocabulary during early childhood proceeds at an amazing pace. Through the process called fast mapping, words are often learned after only one hearing. A closely related process is logical extension, by which children are able to apply newly learned words to other objects in the same category. When children use a uh, learned word to describe other objects in the same category, they may call a spotted cow a Dalmatian cow. Bilingual children often code switch in the middle of a sentence and they realize which language to use by age five. One thing that often alarms the parents of bilingual children is when their children start switching back and forth between languages mid-sentence. This has been misunderstood and mischaracterized as a sign of confusion on the part of the child. Both popular culture and older academic literature will tell you that mixing languages is a bad habit. And you may encounter teachers who still believe this and will bring it to your attention as a concern. Take comfort. The old-fashioned critics are wrong. The most recent literature tells us that most mixed use of language is a natural and positive development in bilingual learners. Bilinguals are much less likely to code switch around people who they do not recognize as sharing their languages. Early childhood is a time for acquiring grammar. The grammar of a language refers to structures, techniques, and rules that communicate meaning. Over-regularization is the application of rules of grammar even when exceptions occur. It makes language seem more regular than it actually is. By age four, many children over-regularize the final S's for pluralization, uh, talking about foots, tooths, and mouses. This is actually evidence of increasing knowledge. Uh, many children first say words correctly, feet, teeth, mice, repeating what they have heard. Later, when they grasp the grammar and try to apply it, they over-regularize, assuming that all constructions follow the regular path. It can certainly be challenging trying to learn two languages. Early childhood is the best time to learn a new language. For children to develop two languages, they must speak as well as hear two languages. Mastering two languages before age six seems to contribute to lifelong neurological benefits. If English fluency is lacking, language minority children often have lower school achievement, uh, diminished self-esteem, and inadequate employment. The text refers to language shifts which occur as children enter school environments. It's becoming more fluent in the school language than in their home language. The text also refers to the benefits of being a balanced bilingual, being fluent in two languages, not favoring one over the other. And it occurs if adults talk frequently, listen carefully, and value both languages. A balanced bilingual is a person who is equally proficient in language one and two, but does not necessarily uh, pass for a native speaker in either language. It may also occur among children who move from country to country, adapting well from one linguistic environment to the next. Balanced bilinguals have a commendable repertoire of languages, but are unfortunately subject to criticism for their lack of native-like fluency in any language. Balanced bilinguals are assets in today's globalized economy as they navigate cross-cultural differences and bridge linguistic divides. To help with language learning, there are five effective strategies for children of all income levels, languages, and ethnicities. One, code-focused teaching. In order for children to read, they must break the code, so to speak, from spoken to written words. It helps if they learn the letters and sounds of the alphabet. For example, A, alligators all around, or conventionally, B is for baby. Two, book reading. Vocabulary as well as familiarity with pages and print will increase when adults read to children, allowing questions and conversation. Three, parent education. When teachers and other professionals teach parents how to stimulate cognition, as in book reading, children become better readers. 
Adults need to use words to expand vocabulary. Unfortunately, too many adults use words primarily to, to control, such as don't touch or stop that, not to teach. Four, language enhancement. Within each child's zone of proximal development, mentors can expand vocabulary and grammar based on the child's knowledge and experience. Five, preschool programs. Children learn from teachers, songs, excursions, and other children. Every study finds that preschools advance language acquisition, especially if the home language is not the majority language. There's been uh, research on the value of early childhood education or preschool. Program research focused on children from low SES families. All programs provided intense education from well-trained teachers. The conclusion was that early education, when done well, results in benefits that become most apparent when children are in the third grade or later. When considering home versus preschool, quality matters. If the home educational environment is poor, a good preschool program aids health, cognition, and social skills. If a family provides extensive learning opportunities and encouragement, the quality of the preschool is less crucial. We conclude this lecture by taking a look at Project Head Start, a federally funded program in the early 1960s to provide preschool education for four-year-olds from low socioeconomic status families or with disabilities. The current goals shifted from lifting families out of poverty to promoting literacy, providing dental care and immunizations, and teaching standard English. New 2016 requirements uh, include six hour days and 180 days yearly with priorities for children who are homeless, have special needs, or are learning English. Historical data suggest most Head Start children advanced in language and social skills but non-Head Start children caught up in elementary school. Head Start children, though, maintained superiority in vocabulary.